People are beginning to pray. I know that I saw that at the South Henderson PH Church that they had prayer. They went over to the schools and had prayer. So churches are beginning to pray again. And, and that's the only key to revival. We will never have the miracle power of God released in our churches until we begin to pray. Prayer is powerful. Say amen. It is the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man that availeth much. So I encourage you, come and be with us as we pray. And it's going to cause a fire to start that will blaze throughout your life, your family, your home. And God will do a great work. In Acts chapter 16, verses 30 and 31, when they brought them out, the people said, what must we do to be saved? The question was asked, what is it? What do I do? How do I get saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. But not only will you be saved, by your commitment and consecration and dedication and change of lifestyle, your entire family will be saved. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the privilege and the opportunity to break the bread of life. As we're talking about family and family salvation and family forgiveness, God, I pray let this be a season of revival for the family. God, save husbands and wives and rededicate and commit their lives. Touch children and grandchildren as every chain of bondage is broke off their life and they go free. God, everything that you do for our families will give you praise on them because, God, to have a great church, we need to have a great family in Jesus' name. And everybody shouts amen. Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 9. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in your heart. He's saying, get the word of God in your heart. And then when you get them in the heart, this is the only way you can teach. That you, you, know, you can have head knowledge and you can know a lot about the word. But until that word gets in your heart, you can't teach anybody anything. But if you get it in your heart, then thou shalt teach them your children diligently. Somebody shout diligently, not carelessly, but diligently, consistently, hard working unto thy children and talk of them that sitteth in the house and when thou walkest by the way and when thou liest down, when thou risest. In other words, create an environment in your house to where you're talking about the Lord. Now some folk never talk about God except in the church. But God says create an atmosphere, a spirit in your house that all they're hearing is the word of God led and, 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 and divine appointed by the word teaching one another by example. And then, then it says, thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and thy gates. See, see, your children need to hear the word of God. Amen. And they can't hear the word of God if you don't know the word of God. Can I, the, your children listen to stuff at school. They're saying it's all right to have casual sex. No, no harm in it. Uh, they're wrong and the word's right. Uh, uh, no need to go to church. Uh, uh, nothing but hypocrites in the church. You're wrong. The word's right. Somebody say amen. We got to get the word in them. And it's the word that destroys the yoke upon their lives and sets them free. They're sick and tired of mom and dad having two masks. A mask for church uh -oh, and a mask for the home. I believe what you shout about, what you preach about, what you live about in church you ought to live it at home hallelujah because you can fool some of the people some of the time you don't fool your children amen it says joshua 24 15 said if it seems evil unto you to serve the lord choose you this day whom you'll serve in other words he said, i can't tell you who to serve Serve who you want to. He said, he said, whether the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now dwell. But as for me, every parent, every guardian, every grandparent has got to say this. But as for me, it starts with me. Look at your neighbor and say, it starts with me. 
It starts with, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Somebody shout amen. Notice Joshua took the lead and said, I'm not only going to say it for myself, but I'm telling you, my family's going to serve God. Well, how do you know? Because I'm going to establish something in my home that's going to eat them up. That when they turn to the left, the word's going to hit them. To the right, the word's going to hit them. There's going to be a Holy Ghost anointing in the house, and therefore I know revival will break out in the house and as for me and my house we'll serve the Lord now now listen to this if he just said I'm going to serve the Lord you think maybe he was the only one maybe maybe he kept it to himself and that's what we have we're secret service Christians and our husbands and wives don't see Christ likeness in us but Joshua said hey if you'll serve the Lord make your mind up and when you do that you, you lay down some ground, ground rules in your house as for me and my house, we're going to say, so ain't nothing coming in my house that would not give glory unto God. Uh-oh. We got to go home and take our homes back. In this sermon, I want to address the subject of training your family for family salvation, for survival. The home is of a critical importance uh, in the stability of the family. The home was created by God. And the home should be filled with Jesus. And parents, it's time to step up. I'm, I'm telling you, too many lazy, careless parents. We, we're pointing our, our fingers at the young people and talking about how sorry they are. It's time for parents to step up. I said this, oh, come on, somebody say amen. Don't get mad at me, amen on me. It's time for parents to step up and exercise the authority of God that is upon your life, amen. Broken homes have bro produced broken people and broken people have scar are scarred and they filled our society with uncertainty and instability. Therefore, if we can heal the home, we can heal the society. That's the reason you go in a, a, a convenience store and a man doesn't mind blowing your head off for, for a Coca-Cola or a pack of nabs or a dollar bill in your pocket because they have no God in them. But if we go and take our families back, it all starts at the house. I firmly believe the only hope for the family today is family worship. We must put God back in the home. Help me right here. It's time to rebuild the family altar. Somebody shout altar. It's time to have some Bible reading with your family. It's good to have private time. But you're a mom, you're a dad. It's time to, to, to pray and read your Bible with your children. Reestablish family values and rise up as leaders and take our families back to God. It is your responsibility to do that. It's not the church's responsibility. We're blaming the preacher and we're blaming the musicians and we're, we're blaming the children's ministry and we're blaming all the teen stuff. But I want to tell you, if you want your children to say, it starts at the house, folks. It starts with you. As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. Somebody say, as for me, as for me. Say, he's talking to me. Years ago, a woman by the name of Madeline O'Hara was instrumental in having prayer taken out of schools. Today our schools are reaping the destruction from that pain, from that act. They're paying the price. Tragedies like Columbine High School, where 12 students and one teacher were shot down without warning, seem to be the beginning of it. And since then, many other things have happened. Listen, every day 12 children die from gun violence in America. There were 27 school shootings this year. 83 people were killed. 119 school shootings since 2018. 34 shootings last year. On May the 24th, 19 children, two adults were killed and 16 others injured. In 2012, a gunman shot and killed 26 people, one as young as six years old. In 2018, 17 people were shot and killed in the school. I'm telling you, our schools, because we have kicked prayer out, and we have kicked God out, then we are under a curse. Now, now I'm going to help you right here. Don't give me, we're never going to see uh, our children saved until we break the curse of our schools. Thank God for the PH church going down there and laying their hands on the signs of the school. We need to get violent and committed and say, you know something, we're not going to let the school system be overtaken by the devil. We're going to rise up and have a voice. Hallelujah. Amen. So it's, listen, here's the deal. It's either going to be God or the devil. 
And the school system has chosen the devil. Years ago, problems in the school were running in the hall, talking in class, making noise, chewing gum. Anybody? You remember those days? Today, the problems range from guns to drugs to gangs to rape to pregnancy to suicide and to murder right in the school. What a drastic shame is. All because we have cursed ourselves by taking prayer out. Our schools and our children are under a curse. And the church has got to pray that curse off the school system. Years ago, the class started each morning with the Pledge of Allegiance and followed by a prayer. Anybody in, in that generation? Every time we started, it was Pledge of Allegiance and prayer. Today, we're not allowed to pray. And we have no respect for the flag because the school has no respect for the flag. Teachers pass out condoms and teach our kids how to have what they call safe sex. Let me pause here and say there's no safe sex uh, 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 outside of marriage. Only between a husband and a wife it covers the sanctity of marriage. All other sex is not safe. It's sin. Somebody needs to hear that. God is still calls it fornication, adultery, uncleanness. He has not changed his mind. I know we've changed our mind and we don't think it's a big deal anymore and everybody is doing it but God said it is still sin. Let me tell you what the Bible, are you ready to what the Bible says? I don't, I'm not legalistic tonight preaching you something out of a religious denomination. I'm going to give you the word. The Bible talks about sexual immorality and, and sex without marriage. The Lord speaks a warning and says this. He says in Galatians 5 21, all as I have also told you in time past, they which do these things those that do these things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, I didn't say it. You say, Pastor, you're judging me. I'm not judging you. The Bible says if you're living like that, you cannot inherit the kingdom of God. I didn't say it. Jesus said it. Amen. So the school says they teach the so-called safe sex, passing out condoms and, and encouraging just be careful and promoting homosexuality as an alternate lifestyle. That is a message from hell. It is a message that is, that is promoting the curse on our schools. And it's causing many children to, to lose what uh, relationship they have with God. A man told me not too long, a couple of weeks ago, standing in my office. He said, the worst thing I ever did was send my kids to college. What? He said, they're now agnostics. They don't believe there's a God. They're not sure whether it's just, I, I'm telling you, we have got to feel them at home so that when they get out there in, the, in hell, they will still have God. Somebody say amen. amen. And so, so many uh, uh, kids are mixed up and confused and deceived. And, and, and to be honest with you, we as parents are playing church. We come, we want to, we don't want to come. Our, our focus and our priorities on everything but God. And our kids are saying, if God's so great, why don't you love him like you should? It's no surprise that the number of live births annually of teens 15 to 19 years old is 494,357, increasing every year. The estimated teen pregnancy rate of teens 15 to 19 is, is 98.7 pregnancy per 1,000 women. That sounds unbelievable, but it's fact. Two-thirds of the births to teens are to unmarried girls. Pregnant teen brides usually divorce within a few years of marriage. Today, 15-year-old girls face a 40% chance of becoming pregnant at least one time before 19. No wonder there are over 4,200 babies aborted every day in America. Let me say this to you. Are you ready? The answer is not abortion. The answer is Jesus Christ. Oh, somebody say amen. It's families taking their homes back. It's families saying, listen, as long as you put your feet under my table on Sunday morning, you might as well get out of bed because you're going to church with me. You have no choice in the matter. Oh, amen. I've heard parents say, I don't want to make them come. You make them go to school. Amen. And so I think it's time to take our home. Innocent blood cries out from trash dumps and sites and doctor's laboratories. God hears that innocent blood. And one day every mother and every doctor and every nurse and every person that promotes abortion will be judged by God. The government and the law may support it, but God doesn't. 
these unborn babies are denied the right to be buried. Did you know that? If the government allows them to be buried, they are admitting they are, are life. So now here's what happens to them. They rip their little par- bodies apart in their mother's womb and throw their little body parts into the dumpster. 4,200 a day. But to add to this wickedness, wow, there's an organization in America called Fetus Harvesters. They buy parts of aborted babies, eyes, livers, kidneys. They encourage pregnant women to go a longer term because then the, the baby's parts are more valuable. And, and they use them in beauty products and even in a lot of medicines. And they try to justify using it. My God, one day they're going to stand before the Lord. It's hard that this is happening in America. When we were born and founded on the Lord Jesus Christ, we've gotten so far off course because our beliefs have changed. Let me speak to the parents for a moment. You have a responsibility of lifting up some standards in your house. You you parents that let anything and everything go, you're wrong. You need to raise up a standard for you. you. You know what the school is teaching them. The only hope for their survival is you train them at home. Because the school is pulling them away from God. And it's your responsibility to build a firm foundation in your home. So, fasten your seatbelt. It's going to get rough right here. So, be careful what you let your children watch on TV. If uncleanness and vulgarness goes in, that's what's going to come out. Be careful what you let them look at on the computer. You say, well, they have their own password. Wrong! You need to be involved in what they're watching on the computer. It's called the web. The web entangles you. You need to see it. And listen, you, you, you need to know, you need to check their phone. Oh, man, it's getting quiet. And I know you young folk don't like this preaching. But we're trying to help you. We're not mad at you. We're trying to help you. We're trying to put an eye in the sky and say, hey, look, we're watching you. And, 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 you know, just a few years ago, one of the trends. Now, listen to this. This is crazy. One of the trends during uh, junior high and high school was taking pictures of their private parts and sending them to one another. That's what hell is doing in our schools. And you, are, you think your little angels or immune to that. Hell is trying to suck them in too. And we need to rise up and say, hey, I need to look at your phone. So, see, I, I believe this. I believe we ought to know who they're talking to on the phone. I believe we ought to know who they're hanging with. I believe we ought to know who they're dating. Get in their business. It's your responsibility. Amen. Oh, I know this ain't going over too well. We need to look at their text. Let me go ahead a little further. You ready for this? This is going to blow you away. Now, kids, you can shout with this one. Wives, you need to be able to look at your husband's text. Husbands, you need to be able to look at your wives. Oh, come on now. Amen. I said, come on now. Amen. And so we need to be careful what we allow in our homes. Uh, those ungodly things light a fire and, 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 and we get out of control. This is going to get me in trouble tonight. I knew I was going to get in trouble. Parents, stop letting your children dress ungodly. They're not prostitutes. Quit dressing them like prostitutes. Amen or oh me. Get mad or not. When you don't screen what your kids are wearing then you will have a spell cast on you. Because when they wear shorty short dresses and mini skirts and tight jeans, come on now, they're sending out a message and the teenage boys are picking it up loud and clear. Come on now. Boy, it's getting quiet in here now. And shorty shorts that are embarrassing to even see on your children. Showing more than two cheeks. You know what I'm talking about. We need some wisdom back in the house. We need to say, honey, I love you. Oh, let me, can I give you scripture for all this I'm preaching? This is not some legalistic preacher from a holiness church. The Bible teaches modest apparel. The word modest means not 
calling attention or exposing too much of one's body, it means decent. So if we want our kids to dress decent, then our parents ought to dress decent. Oh, come on now. Quit trying to live like you're a teenager. I heard John Hagee, a great preacher of the gospel, say this. It used to take a bale of cotton and a meal worker all day to make a woman's dress. Today, a silkworm can do it on his lunch break. That would be funny if it wasn't so serious. Mom and dad, when you can let your children dress ungodly, you, you have a spell on you. And, and I'm telling you, husbands and wives will argue over this. Because they'll get mad. I think it looks okay. I think, what are the standards for our dress? What are the standards for decent and modesty? What is the standard? We need to ask ourselves. Don't be tricked by hell. I, I'll be honest with you. Some of the uniforms of some of the sports that young people I can't believe how short some of the shorts are. I don't, I don't get it. I, I, I just, and I don't get how we're all right with it. I just don't get it. Amen? And so uh, the school is, is conditioning them and convincing them everything's all right. But my prayer is God send a revival. And Lord, if it'll start in the home, it'll start working in the school. Something will happen in the school if it'll happen in the house. I pray our kids rise up. And, and that's the reason we promote our kids' ministry here and our, 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 our uh, kids' jam and our children's ministry, our team ministry. And I know they, sometimes they don't want to go. I, I know we can, that young people, we can find fault with the way everybody does everything. I don't get nothing out there. You need to be in that environment so you can be taught on your level and right down to where you're living. And don't you let the devil run you out of there. Amen. As bad as the school is in the shape it's in, the school is being cursed. Get this, mom and dad. If you're not careful, you and I will allow the devil to curse our homes. That's the reason there's no peace in the home anymore. That's the reason there's so many divorces. That's the reason there's so much chaos. It's because we haven't stood up and said, wait a minute. Now, you need to get in harmony with your husband and wife. Uh, one of the things that Joyce and I have did, uh, many of you remember Pastor Benny Jones has come here and preached. And years ago, his wife, they were close friends of ours, and she was killed in an automobile accident. And I'll never forget that day when he called me. He said, Jeff, you're not going to believe this. He said, Linda was killed in an automobile accident, and, and the granddaughter. And we went down to the funeral. It was a horrible time. I guess that's the reason I don't ever want to go back to Louisiana. I, I felt so bad. But, but, it, but anyway, here, here's what I'm saying. After that, I, I talked with Joyce. And I said, Joyce, let's work on uh, our relationship. Not that there was anything wrong with it. But let's even take it to a new level. Because I would hate to think that you left home one morning and was killed in a car wreck. And we had some type of friction going on. So we don't let little things sweat us anymore. And here's what we do. We check one another. If I say something, she'll say, honey, that, that, that sounded a little ill. I'll immediately say, I'm sorry. And sometimes I'll say to her, honey, that sounded a little sharp. And she'll say, I'm sorry. But what I'm saying is we have decided that peace is more important in the home than anywhere else. With all the responsibility of passing a great church like this, the problems, the many people that are sick, the many people that are dying. You, you know, I get prayer requests all the time, serious prayer requests. People, and then, then people that are, are divorcing and separating and having marriage. I need a place when I go home to be a place of peace. Amen. And when I go home, a place where I can rest. And the home should be the place where you rest, restored, and revived. Amen. And so, so I know Madeline Mary O'Hara took prayer out of school, but Hollywood's taking prayer out of the home. And the thing about it is we're not upset about it. We have got this thing about us that we've got a spell cast on us that we're accepting more stuff today than we ever. Our great-grandparents would roll over in their grave to what we call acceptable today. And so I'm closing with this. If you'll play me something softly, here's what I'm saying. It's time to train one another to have family salvation in the home. We got to train ourselves 
to teach our children the ways of the Lord. Stand here.